From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, and I hear everything production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Shapiro, and today we're going to discuss how in-content advertising has emerged as a powerful tool for reaching engaged audiences. Joining us is Stefan Berenger, who is the CEO of Myriad, which is an in-content advertising platform built by AI and built on Academy Award-winning entertainment technology that enables builders and creators of brands to engage with audiences at new levels of relevance and impact. And today, Stefan and I are going to talk about in-content advertising and streaming. All right, here's the first part of my conversation with Stefan Berenger, the CEO of Myriad. Stefan, welcome to the MarTech Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. Excited to have you here. I will go on the record. Apologies. My nanny didn't show up the first time we were supposed to record this conversation. (laughs) I totally flaked on you, and I'm very excited to have this conversation. But you know what? Sometimes life as a content creator isn't as simple as showing up on set and someone saying action and you go. It gets a little complicated. Turns out that's not just a solopreneurship. That's also happening. Movies, TVs, they're incredibly complex ways to build content. And it's not just about content production. Product placement, in-content advertising, also an increasingly important topic in media production. And you are an expert of this as the CEO of Myriad. You're putting products and in-content advertising and streaming content all the time. Tell me a little bit about how you think about the segmentation of in-content advertising and streaming. So a simple way to look at this is, first of all, there's a distinction to be made in terms of, we're calling it advertising, but it's in-content advertising. And why are we calling it in-content advertising? Because effectively, whatever we put into the content is in the content and not between the content. Sounds a bit weird now what I'm saying here, but the way we're used to digest or ingest advertising is basically we're watching a piece of content and here comes the lovely interruption. And then we're told, watch this ad. And guess what? Watch this other ad. And then the content eventually continues playing. What we do is different. So in content advertising puts the brand or the product into the content itself. So you're watching whatever, a series and there's a living room and or a kitchen and in the kitchen, on the kitchen table, you will see a box of cereals, right? So that's why it's actually in the content. It's in content. And content advertising acts as the umbrella term, if you will, or umbrella concept for different things you can do in the content, right? So you can put, or we can put a video onto a TV screen that is in the living room or onto a digital billboard. So it's basically video in video then. Or we put, as I mentioned before, a pack of cereals on the kitchen table and then it's virtual product placement. Again, part of in-content advertising. Or alternative, we put an ad on a magazine that is somewhere in the living room or we put a billboard onto a skyscraper or a big building. So there's many shades and different creative executions when you think about in-content advertising. But again, the thing keeping it together is that it happens effectively in the content and not as an interruptive device. What I'm hearing from you is the first thing that marketers need to think about is the style of content, whether they want to be disruptive or additive to the content. And look, we have advertisements in the MarTech podcast. Everybody listening to this conversation has already heard at least two of them. And I hate to tell you, there's going to be a one minute break to hear from our sponsor somewhere in the middle of this content, which personally, I'm not a huge fan of, even though it's my show. I feel like it's disruptive, but... When we were figuring out our advertising strategy, we started getting negative feedback by putting too many advertisements before the content started, but we had commitments to our advertisers, so we needed to drop an ad in the middle of the content. 
I think it's disruptive. I'd rather have the whole conversation run in its entirety, but we got feedback that said, stop interrupting the short form content that you're producing. So it'd be great if we could say, hey, look, we're the MarTech podcast. Let's have a conversation. And in the context of the conversation, I could talk about miracle hand cream, which I'm holding up a <laughs> bottle of with 60% aloe for dry, cracked, rough, flaking hands. I was using bartender's friend washing the dishes the other day, and I have like chemically peeled all the skin off my hands. And now I've got this hand cream out here. Moral of the story is, hey, look, I just did a product placement for Miracle Hand Repair Cream by the Miracle of Aloe that was integrated into the content. Now, you mentioned there's different ways to do that. You can either disrupt the content and integrate your Miracle Hand Repair Cream into the flow of the content, or you can just use it as an example and not have it be actively part of the content, but passively like a billboard behind a speaker on a TV show. Talk to me about the value of those two types of placements. Why are those different or better or worse? You just said something very interesting here in terms of the audiences who are listening to a podcast or who are watching a piece of content as a video. There's basically the level of frequency, which is really the annoying part. So eventually everybody understands and appreciates the fact that content needs to be paid for. So advertising is the way to do it if you're not paying a huge subscription. But the issue is just that over time, we started getting bombarded with ads and being interrupted all the time. And this is where things start getting annoying. And the issue then for the advertiser is that many people just switch off. They walk out of the room or they look at their phones and do other things. So we have evidence now that 86% of people who are exposed to ads basically don't look at them. So here comes a very simple way to look at what the value that we bring to the table is that we happen in the content. So effectively, per default, people are seeing the content because otherwise they wouldn't be watching it. So the exposure is like almost 100%. So that's number one. Number two is the fact that just like in your example now, in a very credible manner, you have explained why this cream is so effective for you and relevant. Now, but jokes aside, because we place a product or a brand in a context that is relevant, again, think back to the cereal on the kitchen table, it just has a very, very positive influence and effect on the viewer who will start associating the context of breakfast and kitchen with that particular cereal brand. So it's these two factors that really sit at the very core in terms of people paying attention. And number two, it's the relevance that is just so much higher than, in a way, just an ad that comes flying in and basically is stopping you from watching. Now that you mentioned it, I want to tell you that Miracle Hand Repair Cream is guaranteed to help soften, dry, rough, cracked skin, reduce flaking and redness, use on hands, elbows, and knees, and it's safe for use by diabetics. Now, the reason why I'm going into so much detail about this lovely miracle hand cream, which really has helped my hands feel a lot better. When you're talking about an advertisement, right? When I'm doing a mid-roll podcast ad, I've got 30 seconds, not only to mention a product, not only to show or talk about how I use it, but I can also get into the details of how it works, what the call to action is, where you can buy it. I'm pretty sure I got this one at miracleofallo.com. It's hard to be able to, in content advertising, not only show an affinity for the product, not only show how it should be used, but also basically to get the rest of the advertisement out, get to the call to action. So when you're thinking about doing in content advertising, some sort of product placement, are you thinking about, all right, well, the guys in billions drink Michter's bourbon or drink Heineken. That's always something that's in this show that me and my wife watch. And I'm like, oh, yeah, there's clearly a financial relationship between, I think it's Diadagio, that's promoting the liquor for this show. And they're showing famous people drinking their booze. I get it. But they're not saying you can go get it at Safeway. Talk to me about the call to action. Well, the call to action is obviously something that when I think about all the healthcare advertisement with 500 miles of text in terms of when to use it, not to use it in this very language, that's obviously not something we can do. And I think in content advertising is not meant to do that. The call for action is that's an interesting question because the real question is, do you need the call to action to say, buy the hand cream or get it there? 
if you've seen the brand, I dare to ask who out there is not able, once the brand is recognized, to understand where to buy it. Do you know what I mean? Do you actually need to know the URL of the website to get it? Or will you go to some online retail or wherever you buy your drugstore stuff? So we have measured that actually even, and now I'm using marketing jargon, on the lower funnel in terms of really activating towards consumption and purchase, actually in content advertising is delivering a plus, on average, plus 35% incremental performance, right? And that is without the call to action that you just mentioned. Of course, you still use call to actions in DR and other areas, but in our case, I don't think it's really needed anymore. You bring up an interesting point of with an advertisement, what's your goal? Are you trying to build brand awareness? Are you trying to build affinity? Are you trying to get someone basically through the last mile? Are you trying to get them to take some sort of direct response action? And my feeling within content advertising, mostly in streaming, is that the actual product placement is awareness and affinity driving. It cannot be a direct response driving channel. Even though there might be some measurable direct response results, the ad is just not meant or the placement is not meant to get people to get up and go buy the product now. It's meant to plant the seed so all of your other marketing activities work. But you're specifically working in streaming, which means that there is a digital placement is there a way that you're using the sort of in-content advertising and then able to understand who was exposed and retarget or follow up with more direct response-based ads? So that's an interesting question that takes me into the whole area of dynamic and programmatic, because effectively what we're able to do is to serve different versions of the same content. And when I say different versions, I mean branded differently. You could just say you have a soft drink and you could have the sugarless or the low sugar and full flavor or whatever versions played out to different people. But again, it's the same content. And I think the precision that we can get through that is an extremely powerful additive in terms of heightening or augmenting the relevance even further, because whoever is the target for a specific brand product or message will receive that and the other person won't. So when we take that back, and you haven't asked me the question, but I'll just go ahead in terms of main difference to, if you will, the traditional product placement approach is that when you're filming something and then the advertiser, the brand or the agency come to the set and then they put the can on the table and then it's filmed and it's in there. That's it. Done. <laughs> it will be in there forever. And you can't play it out dynamically. You can target anyone. You cannot refresh the can because eventually brands evolve and they look different from one year to the next and so forth. You get the idea. So clearly the possibility to do it dynamically is just a complete game changer. So tell me a little bit about the mechanism of buying ads or in-content advertising. How much do you have to think about the right show, right? How your product is going to be highlighted. You mentioned that you have to have some sort of a product available during filming. I'm sure that we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can update your creative, but there has to be some sort of science or logic behind understanding who you're targeting and which shows you should be selecting to have your product placements. Tell me a little bit about the process of how you figure out what your media budget should be, what your campaigns look like, and most specifically, what creative you're integrated into. So these are questions that obviously are buy-side driven. Again, a little bit of jargon here, but ultimately it's the advertiser and the agency who will say, well, this is the audience that we want to reach for this and that product. This is the flight time. We want to invest this and that budget. And ultimately it's them who will then decide, well, we want to push our shaver brands or shaving brands and let's go and buy some bathrooms. I'm simplifying this, right? And they will go and search for the relevant context in, of course, also content franchises that are relevant to their audience, because otherwise it doesn't make so much sense. Yeah, but how do you search for shows with bathrooms? Well, that's because on our end, we feed ultimately the content partner who is selling the inventory with the relevant data. So the partner has all the data the partner needs in terms of the duration of the insertion opportunities, the locales in terms of where is it happening, some contextual information. And these things will get better and better and better. And we're just talking this, this afternoon with a big agency about that. And ultimately then the next big thing will be targeting by emotions. 
But coming back to the question, then once the advertiser and the agency have figured out where they want to run it, they will ultimately allocate a budget against a level of impressions and say, yeah, we want to have whatever, a million, two, three, four delivered in that demo, in that context and content, and then they will press start and buy. And then ultimately the machines will execute the buy. I guess the last question I have for you, when it comes down to in-content advertising, most of the time when I think about product placement, I'm thinking, all right, Pepsi has a relationship with Warner Brothers Studios or Paramount, and Paramount's creating Transformers, and they're shooting it, and it's going to launch next year, and they're looking for a vendor to promote a a soda. So we know there's going to be a soda can. It's going to be a Pepsi, and that relationship is built a year and a half advance because it's taped and it's recorded and then it's done. It seems like there is more flexibility into doing product placements more than just it's going to be on set two years before the ad actually runs. How do you think about the advanced timing that you need to have a successful product placement? And how do you think about the budget that should go in to make sure that your campaign is effective? We have seen on occasions now where Even an allocation of 10% of your budget. So let's just say you have 100% today, it all goes into TV, and now you're starting to split 90 TV and 10 in content. And if you do that, number one, you will reach more people because more people see the content. So you have a winner right there. But secondly, the impact is so much stronger. So again, it's hard for me to say, well, if you invest a minimum of a million or two, then... The effect starts much lower. We measure that. So even if you put three, four hundred thousand in a small campaign, you will see an effect. But obviously, if you run it in sync with your overall mix, then you will have a greater impact. The other part of the question was, how long in advance do you have to buy the media? You don't have to buy it a long time in advance at all. At the end of the day, between the decision, when you think about it programmatically, ultimately, the opportunity gets surfaced and the buy happens in the millisecond. So in that scenario, the lead time equals zero. The lead time is on our end to get the scenes ready for multiple brands, which we can do. That's not the issue. It's when things are more linear. So in in traditional broadcast television, where you have a little bit longer lead times because there's an operational lift that needs to happen on the cable broadcaster side. And so these things take a little bit longer, also because the booking mechanisms from the agency side is just not as fast as running an ad or buying an ad programmatically. So as it turns out, product placement isn't something that you need to plan multiple years in advance. Yes, there absolutely is a minimum threshold to make a campaign viable, and it's in the six figures. But if you're already a television advertiser and you're moving your budgets from linear television to streaming TV, it's worth considering that you might want to move away from being a pure advertiser and move some of your budget into in-content advertising. And that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Stefan Berenger, the CEO of Myriad. Join us again tomorrow when Stefan and I continue our conversation talking about virtual product placement. If you can't wait until our next episode and you'd like to learn more about Stefan, you can find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can contact him on Twitter. His handle is Stefan Berenger. That's S-T-E-P-H-A-N. B-E-R-I-N-G-E-R, or you could visit his company's website, which is myriad.com, M-I-R-R-I-A-D.com. Just one more link in our show notes I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com, where we have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter, and you can even sign up to be our next guest speaker on the Martech Podcast. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is MartechPod, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or you can contact me directly. My handle on LinkedIn is Ben J. Shap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we're going to publish an episode every day this year. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.